So I, I guess you have uh, understood by now, <clears throat> when you study the Trinity, you study the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ, his humanity, his deity, and a number of other related, correlated things. So we're looking at Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a descendant, human descendant, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. And our Lord's birth into humanity is in that family line of David. We compare scripture with scripture and we get that conclusion. Matthew 1.1 1, 1, all the way through 16 to 17. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, feminine singular, of Mary was born Jesus, who was called Christ, Messiah. Verse 17, there were, and thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Christ. Joseph was our Lord's legal, but not biological father, whose family line is traced through the royal line, the line of actual rulers of Israel, of Solomon to David, including King Jeconiah. And thereby our, our Lord received Joseph's legal and royal family descendancy to, according to the scripture. However, in Jeremiah 22, 24 to 30, God prohibits descendants from the wicked king Jeconiah because of his reign to sit on the throne of David or rule anywhere anymore in Judah. So we have it covered. Incidentally, the word which is translated as son is not limited to an immediate descendant but often refers to his descendant of several or more generations as it does here in Matthew's genealogy. Matthew does not include every single descendant in his gene genealogy. But rather he arranges it so that it highlights important points and is more easily memorized. We have in Luke's account of our Lord's genealogy, 323-38, our Lord's human family line is traced through Nathan to David, which does not have the prohibition of rulership on it. Isn't it interesting that the genealogy, the trinity, of, uh, and many other subjects work together, God allowing for the free will decisions of mankind, good or evil. God prophesies through his word what will happen and how it takes a God-man to provide for the human race its sinfulness to be restored in a new order, the millennial kingdom and eternity. And despite the evilness of people's willful decisions to go against that, it works out precisely as God has decreed it. Not where people are made into robots, but of their own volition. They'll do what they can to undermine God's sovereignty yet his sovereignty prevails. Isn't it wonderful that in eternity, God's sovereignty still prevails? He's not depending upon our sovereignty, even though we're in perfect resurrection bodies. But yet, our free will volition will decide what we choose to do in eternity, other than the fact that we can't choose to do evil. And we have uh, a broadened horizons in our eternity, by being faithful in this temporal life. 
Doesn't it say it all works together for good? Amen. This is a tricky keyboard. So, Luke 3, 23 to 38. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph. Notice that, so it was thought. The son of Eli, the son of Matthat, the son of Levi, the son of Malia, the son of Mena, the son of Matala, Matatha, the son of Nathan, and the son of David. C.I. Schofield, in the NIV Study Bible, that was my first Bible. Good notes there, some questionable. So you have to sort through everything as you do when you study the Bible. Since every man has two genealogies, one through his father and another through his mother, so Matthew presents Joseph's genealogy, the Lord's foster or legal father. He is the legal father, nor his, not his actual father, whereas Luke presents Mary's genealogy. This is permitted in these official genealogies. This view is supported by linguistic and historical evidence and is held by many students of the Bible. In addition, appeal may be made to Numbers 27, 1 to 11, and 36, 1 to 12 to give scriptural precedent for the substitution of Joseph's name in Luke 3:23. At the same time, it avoids the judgment spoken of in Jeremiah 22, 28 to 30. Despite mankind's willfulness and sinfulness, God decreed these things within the framework of the willful the free volition of mankind. Jeremiah 22, 28 to 30 prohibits a descendant of Jeconias from ruling Israel. So genealogies are constructed from the male side. Although Matthew's genealogy does mention women, notice that the line of the genealogy is strictly through the male names. So our Lord's descendancy as traced through his human mother would first state that he is the son, is the son of Joseph. Since Joseph was Mary's husband, the male, then the genealogy would properly move to Mary's side of the family and begin with the next generation related to our Lord, who is the son, son equal descendant of Heli on Mary's side, who is the son of Matthat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of another, Joseph, and so on. It fits perfectly. And that's what we're looking at now, Matthew 123 to the uh, to 24. And when our Lord grew up to be a man, he fulfilled every single biblical Bible prophecy, some of which follow here. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We have the perfect humanity of Christ in view here, albeit he's the God-man. Isn't that interesting how the Trinity works? That's what is presented, but what is not presented, but yet true, is the Trinity is always present because it's one God, three personalities, with the Son of God adding to himself, having added to himself perfect humanity. Malachi 3.1 Behold, I, Jehovah God, am going to send my messenger, John the Baptist, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Genesis 49.10 The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the staff, ruler's staff, from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. Zechariah 13.7 Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man, my associate, 
declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. So Jehovah God Almighty will raise his sword against his shepherd, a man, his associate. Associate in the uh, Hebrew is Amit. In the context of this passage, Jehovah God refers to a, a man who is his Amit, his fellow, his equal. So this shepherd, this man, is equal to Almighty Jehovah God. He therefore is God, God the Messiah, Jesus Christ. See how that works out. Man's volition, allowed to contain his sin nature and operate under his own will. Yet at the drawing of God, some will choose to believe of their own volition, but yet God has provided a special dispensation toward them, the elect, and they choose to believe. Others are not so chosen, and they go their own way, <clears throat> often, perhaps at the incitement of the devil, to try to undermine God's decrees. But God being almighty, all sovereign, his decrees will come to pass. So Isaiah chapter 53 provides further details of the death of the Messiah, which it states was for the purpose of paying for the sins of the whole world. And Isaiah 35, 4 describes this Messiah, who is God, and who will come to save faithful Israel. So Isaiah chapter 53 provides further details of the death of the Messiah, which it states was for the purpose of paying for the sins of the whole world. And Isaiah 35, 4 describes this Messiah, who is God, and who will come to save the faithful of Israel, and the whole world, for that matter, if you keep on reading, and you read also 1 John 2, 2, and Titus 3, 4 to 7. Titus, Isaiah 35, 4, say to those with palpitating heart, take courage, fear not, behold your God will come with vengeance, the recompense of God will come but he will save you. And the Messiah is to rule the world with an iron scepter. Psalm 2, 6 to 12. But as for me, I, God, have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Not in a human sense, but in an establishment sense of the duty of a son, characteristic of the Father, Jesus Christ in his deity, and in his humanity. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as thy inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. See how this works together for good. Study it so yourself approve. You won't have any questions if you study it properly in the Bible about all of these key issues. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And our Lord claimed to be the Messiah. And we have a specific particular definition, <clears throat> HaMashiach, the Messiah. The woman at the well said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Now she knew, Samaritan, but she knew from somehow through her scriptures. He who is called Christ, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. We don't have to fill in the blanks. The Bible has them all ready for you to understand Jesus Christ is the coming Messiah. So the Lord Jesus Christ was to be born of a virgin, and he would be called by a name that would signify that God is with us. Isaiah 7, 14. You don't have to just take the Bible carefully in its detail, and we proclaim, who is the Messiah? Who is the Trinity? Who is the Son of God? Who is the Christ? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, in Hebrew, is not referred to in this passage as a specific name by which our Lord is to be called. Other passages determine his uh, specific name, like Matthew one twenty one. Rather, the word Emmanuel is a characterization which is to describe the nature of our Lord. 